Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of Commission Breath. Brandon Love here with Tom Moffat. And our special guest today is Jill Mollering. And if you're in the mortgage industry, especially if you're a newbie or new in the recent years, you definitely know Jill because she runs the Newbie Professionals Group on Facebook and absolutely crushes it with answers and providing value for free to everyone, which she's really gracious in doing. I know I found a ton of value there myself. And Tom and I had the benefit of hearing Jill speak at the Strategy Hub event. And we were like, there are so many ideas there. We just want to unpack some of these for the Commission Breath community who couldn't make it out. So Jill, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me on here. It's nice to be asked. Finally. It's nice to finally be asked. (laughs) Good stuff. Okay, Jill. Well, at that Strategy Hub event, I know you just kind of like hit us over the head with so much value. And I was like trying not to be the person furiously scribbling notes, but there was so much good stuff there. So it's really great to have you on so that we can kind of isolate some of those ideas and go deep on them. Yeah, no, that sounds great. It's tough when you do an event like that and you have an hour and you want to pack as many gems into an hour as you possibly can, right? And I appreciate the opportunity to be able to sort of, you know, delve into some of those items a little bit deeper too, because I don't do a great job necessarily of always articulating all the thoughts in my brain and getting them out, especially in a very time controlled event like that, right? So. Well, I thought you crushed it. And going back to your presentation, I know that you like to use the occasional F-bomb and that is fully welcome on this podcast. Oh, uh, fuck. That that is is terrible. Terrible. Yeah. No, I, I was, I was worried because, you know, I usually have to give a disclaimer before I do, you know, PG-13, like don't listen to Jill's meetings or pods or whatever. If you've got kids in the room, make sure they're in your headphones, whatever. Right. I always have to tell people, you know, full disclosure about my potty mouth, right? Well, this is a safe space. Yeah, we're definitely not formal here. And, you know, you thought we were going to be dressing up here. And then you saw me with my backwards hat and T-shirt. You're like, oh, who's this fucking bum over here? I don't care anymore. <laughs> so <laughs> we don't have the camera on today. Um, no, perfect. I was at a conference in Vancouver recently and a Dr. Robin Henley Defoe was there and she was talking in her presentation and she made a comment about how people who swear live longer. So I feel like I'm just going to swear extra because I feel like I'm working on the 110 fear here. So the chilled back, relax, let Jill's potty mouth fly. Really, guys, you're doing me a favor in extending my lifespan. Good stuff. I'm going to use it at the dinner table today and be like, I'm going to have some more fucking vegetables. (laughs) So (laughs) live longer. Yeah, pretty much. Okay, now that this is a health podcast, re-steer us back into mortgages. The health of your upcoming business, right? Of the upcoming next few years of mortgage business? Exactly. And before we dive into that, I just wanted to share a little mindset piece that you shared was probably my biggest takeaway of the day, was that so many people are focused on kind of what they're losing this year in terms of revenue and maybe leads to certain people or different things like that. And you had a great takeaway where you're like, okay, maybe you lose a bit on the three year, but focus on what your business is going to look like in 2027. And the value you provide clients today is going to lead to a really beautiful future that way. Yeah, you know what? Thanks for bringing that up because I do think that mindset is one of the biggest parts about our business and how we go into this, right? It's really easy for brokers right now to look at their business and be disappointed or be frustrated when, as an example, you know, I had a bigger deal the other day fund and that lender was paying, you know, 50 bips or something on a three-year term. And so I got paid this week and I thought, ah, Jesus, like, you know, this should be a, you know, six or $7,000 commission and it's a, you know, 2,500 or three grand, whatever it was, right? And there are those moments where you're like, oh my God, like we're getting paid half as much here. But the flip side to this, and this is also sort of the mentality that I've taken with alt lending as well. You know, in Alberta here, it's not very common to charge fees to top up on alt lending. So we paid 50 bips on those deals usually, right? 50, 60 bips at the most. And so the mentality for that has always been for me, I'm like, yeah, I might take a little less right now, but I'm going to get paid on it again next year when I move it or in two years when I move them to the A side or whatever, right? And so over a five-year period, period of time, you get paid more on that deal by touching it a couple of times than you would if you would just place them in a five-year fix, you know, right off the bat at a bank and got paid your 120 basis points or whatever it is. So from the mindset perspective, I've really looked at this as well. You know, we have all these renewals coming up in the next couple of years. You know, as you guys know the stats, it's over $900 billion worth of mortgages that are up for renewal between now and the end of 2026. There's $400 billion in 2026 coming up for renewal. 
But the piece that people, you know, keep not thinking about, we're thinking about, you know, all of those mortgages from 2020, 2021, sort of coming into renewal part time. But all of the business we've been placing last year and this year are also going to be coming up for renewal, you know, in 26, 27. So really, if you change your mindset about this and talk about, hey, the strategy of where am I placing these piles in the first place, making sure that I understand and know lenders retention policies at renewal time. And is it likely that I'm going to be able to move this mortgage in a few years when that renewal does come up? But you're setting yourself up for 2027. So stop worrying about making a little bit less this year because your next three years are going to be enormous. If you can tackle that business properly and you can retain those clients, keep in touch with your database, work that database. Like all of my renewal business from 2019 has been in touch. Like all of my files, you know, everybody's in touch because I've been in touch with them, right? So if you're setting yourself up properly, like brokering is a long game. I think sometimes mentality wise, we get so caught up in getting paid on this particular file, right? We think about like, you know, this one deal and we're in the deal and we're trying to find a solution for the deal. And we think about that specific deal as either, you know, a paycheck or not. So a lot of times we don't wrap our head around the bigger picture, which is the relationship with the referral partner or the players that are part of it. What other deals might there be in the future on this? What's this client's portfolio look like? Or what does this file look like three years from now or five years from now at their renewal? And you know, what does that opportunity look like for us? So long answer to a short moment, I guess. But yeah, I think mindset's really important and it's going to be really important because we're about to go into a really tough period. I think the next couple of years are going to be hard. It's going to be challenging for brokers because we are going to be rate shopped a ton. We're going to have stressed out clients. Clients are going to be in a position where they are you know, struggling with affordability. We're going to be trying to find solutions for them. There's going to be payment shock when they hit that renewal. And maybe the property didn't appreciate enough. Maybe they can't do much. We're going to do a lot of coaching, a lot of you know, therapy with our clients around that. So it is going to be a tough few years, I think, to get through. And I think having that right mindset is going to be a big piece of it, right? You might lose a lot more files, but you also, you're going to get more phone calls, right? So being able to go into it the right way, the right head on your shoulders is going to be a big part of getting through it, I think. Yeah. And Brandon and I, we joke about it on a day-to-day -day basis because we're almost bipolar right now in this market because some days we're feeling really good. We're like, oh, these clients are super sticky. I enjoy working with them. And then some days are horrible because it's like, shit, I just lost two files to the bank. This sucks. And I think having that mindset piece is crucial in this market and going forward, like you mentioned. And also like the refi business too, you're going to have a bit more of that coming into a declining rate environment too. So there's plenty of opportunities out there. But speaking of the renewal opportunities, we all know they're out there, they're coming, there's much more to come. But when it comes to like your process, if we can kind of like start from the beginning of when we have that discovery call booked, what are some of the things that you're looking for to kind of filter whether you can help these people or not? Like with the banks being super aggressive right now, are you kind of filtering them in and saying, hey, you know what? Like I'm providing all of this service strategy and all of these upfront value adds to them. But at the end of the day, if all they want is rate, and I know I can't compete on that, are you saying right then and there, hey, go back to your bank and ask them for a lower rate, away you go? Like what's kind of your strategy there? Yeah. So I guess my first approach with the client is to find out, you know, what's the issue at hand, right? Okay. We've got a mortgage. It's coming up for renewal. Have you talked to your existing lender about renewal options? A lot of times they haven't. And so right off the bat, I'll send them back to the existing lender and say, get your renewal quotes, get your options from them for your renewal, and then call me back. And we'll talk about those rates and we'll compare. But also in that conversation, I want to ascertain, like I've had a few of them that have messaged me right off the bat and said, I can't afford this. Like my bank has quoted me the renewal rates. And this is where the opportunity I think is coming from for us, right? The bank has quoted them the renewal rates. They've told them what their new payment's going to be. And they're phoning me going, I can't afford my new payment to be $500 a month higher or $800 a month or $2,000 a month higher, right? If they're coming from a static payment variable or a one and a half percent, right? Like, you know, I've had a lot of these phone calls where they're like, this rate is insane and I'm not happy with it. And I can't afford that, right? The other scenario is just that everyone is going to shop around now. When the interest rates were 2% or 2.5%, nobody cared about really shopping around, you know, getting 2.5%. 
six versus 2.7 wasn't really a big deal breaker for most people. So they just signed and they stayed where they were. But when their existing bank is offering them over 5% and the media and the news and everything that they hear about is interest, interest, interest rates, inflation, inflation, Bank of Canada, like they're being bombarded with that kind of information all the time. It does put the idea more in their head to shop around a little bit more. So you're going to get those full calls. And yeah, there's going to be sometimes like I've had them where the bank's offer is so good. I'm just like, what you phoning me for, man? Like, yeah, that's the best yeah. you're going to do, right? But what I want to do is sort of ascertain if there's other opportunity or things that I can do for those clients to help them and figure out what the issue is. So I'll often ask, you know, okay, what's the pain point for you? Are you comfortable with where your payments are at? Are you worried about the increased payment? Or, you know, do you have other debts that you would want? Like, what does the overall picture look like for you right now? What's your biggest pain point? Is it just that you want the lowest interest rate? Or are you actually concerned about monthly cash flow and monthly affordability? Nine times out of 10, like clients are more concerned about their cash flow and their monthly affordability than they are about the interest rate. You know, if you say to them, I've done this a few times where I've been like, would you care what the interest rate was if your payment's lower? And some of them are like, no, not a chance. And some of them are like, well, maybe, like, I don't want to push my mortgage out back to 30 years necessarily, but I don't also want my payment to go up by 800 bucks a month, right? So then you can kind of find that middle ground for them. So first intake call, I'm going to ask them, you know, what are your pain points? What exactly are we looking for here? Are you comfortable with where your payments are at? Do you care if their payments go up? Because they are about to go up. You know, are you worried about that? Is monthly cash flow an issue? Do we have other debts that you want to consolidate? Is there anything else that we want to maybe do in this transaction at this time, right? You know, what are your five-year plans? What's the plans for the house? I want to make sure that we're setting them up in the right product. So I'll have like a bit of that conversation. But ultimately, I am sending them to get their rate quotes from their existing lender first before I really start working on that application. I want to know what I'm up against. Because if they're, you know, at a big bank that's offering them like 4.6 to renew, I can't get that anywhere. I'm like, wow, if all you care about is rate, take that and go. And then I haven't wasted my time with an application, right? And also, you know, to that point as well, I want to send them back to their bank and get that quote before I get a commitment. Because I don't want to pull a commitment from a lender, especially not at the 11th hour, when their existing lender came back and offered them a better rate. So I want them to go through that process of calling their lender, trying to negotiate for a lower rate, having the lender be bit obstinate with them. Some of our big banks, they say to the client, oh, well, if you go get a better rate, bring it back to me and I'll match it. When they hear that, right, and they call me, then the conversation is really easily where I can say, why would you go back to them? Like, they're only going to give you the rate if someone else offers it to you. That's shitty. Like, this lender over here is willing to give you this rate today, never even having met you, but your existing lender who already knows that you're a good client won't give you this rate unless somebody else offers it to you first. Why would you go back to those guys? Right. And now the clients are more bought into working with you. Right. So you're creating doubt there. And I think that's key because they second guess like the honesty and transparency that this lender is providing to them and they're doubting it. So when you're telling them to go back for that quote, are you telling them, Hey, see if they can match this? Or are you just saying generally like go ask for the quote on rates and then come back to me? How does that conversation go? Uh, yeah, no, I just say, go get what they're offering you and bring it back to me. Okay. So I'm not telling them like, oh, the lowest out there right now is, you know, four, six, nine on a five year, right. you know, or whatever, you know, I'm not giving them that information just yet. I'm like, go get your offers, bring them back to me and I'll see if I can beat them. Because inevitably that's what's going to happen. If you tell the client, well, I can get you four, six, four on this renewal. They're going to go back to the lender and say, well, the broker told me 464 and the lender is going to go, yeah, exactly. oh, well, I'll see if I can match that, you know, or whatever. Right now, they've got the upper hand. I want to be the one with the upper hand. I want the client to come to me with their rate quotes. And now I have the chance of, you know, selling, right, where I can be like, OK, and I know what that gap looks like. I want that gap to be super attractive. I know I mentioned this at the event, but I buy down rates on renewals all the time. I just submitted one last night. I'm doing a full buy down on a variable for the clients. Their existing lenders offering them prime minus 0.8. I'm buying down to prime minus 1.15 for them. I wanted that gap to be so big that the other lender wasn't willing to play ball on that. So they went, they had their renewal offers. They came to me. I'm like, oh yeah, 0.8. I can get you 1.15 as a discount. You know, I sent them their homework list. I sent them their docs. I said, if you want to call them back and see if they'll match that, be my guest. If they won't, send me all your docs. 
two days later, sent me all their docs, right? So that file is in. I know that that lender wasn't willing because the gap was so big. If I had gone back and said, well, I'll get you prime minus 0.85. And then they go back to their existing lender. Their lender's probably saying, oh, sure, I'll match that. And then they come back to me and go, oh, well, they're going to match that. And then I go, oh, well, I could do prime minus 0.9. Oh, and then they go back. And then you're just in this perpetual back and forth. Like, I'll just go to a big app right off the bat that makes it look so large that either they don't bother going back to the initial lender or that initial lender is like, oh, that's a massive gap. I can't just match that today. So I do that part first because I want to know I want to have the ball in my court. I want to know what that lender is offering on those renewals. And then I want to wow that client with the rate and the service that I'm going to offer them. And that's where I take in that application and fire it through from there. I love that idea of doing the full buy down as well. Because if the bank does match it, it just makes them bleed that little bit more. 100%. Like there's sometimes where like I've had calls where the clients are like, hey, like I filed a consumer proposal last year, you know, and I'm like, look, I can't move your mortgage. You will have to renew. But I'm going to make your lender eat their lunch in the meantime. So I'll write you an email that says the rock bottom lowest interest rate that's out there. And I'll say I'm offering it to you and you take that to them and get them to match it. Because yeah, like, of course, if they're going to get that bid, see how low you can get them to come, you know, in that negotiation, right? Just to get them to come down a bit. Because yeah, like if they're going to retain the client, we might as well eat their lunch while they do it, right? Exactly. To any of the lenders, if they're listening, we do love the ones that are in the channel. I love doing that to someone like the like, big lion bank. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Same. Yeah. And <laughs> for the fact, like of all of the lenders that I move clients away from the most at renewal, it's they who shall not be named, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tom with the not so subtle. <laughs> and the interesting piece of that is like, who's our biggest competition right now on rate? That's those guys. Am I still moving oh, yeah, markets away from them? Absolutely. I have a renewal on my desk right now from them, right? So it is possible to beat them at that game. I don't feel bad at all because they literally train their reps to take business from us and bash us and say things that are not true about brokers. Like they literally have training on training these reps. So I don't feel bad stealing business from them. I think we're doing a service to our clients doing that. Yeah, I'll leave it at that. So with... Getting new business into your pipeline, you mentioned a lot about your database circling back. And that's awesome for people who are several years in and have that database built up. For those people who might be listening, who maybe got started in the pandemic or maybe don't have a lot coming up for renewal, how would you recommend that they get some of that renewal business into their orbit? Fun fact, my first, I think, five files I ever did were all renewals. And so it was about touching base with my existing database. And a lot of people confuse the term database with your past clients. They think of database equals your past clients. Database is anyone in your orbit, like your sphere, your wedding list, you know, who did you invite to your wedding? Anybody that you know. So yeah, like my first handful of files that I did were all renewals. They were all people up at renewal. The first one was a refinance at renewal, you know, moving them out of a private over to a credit union. Then the next three were like transfer switches at renewal and stuff. And that was all just from my database. It wasn't purchase business, right? So this was talking to my friends, talking to my family about their mortgages and what was coming up for renewal. So great opportunity for you that exists in your social circles and just marketing to that, right? You know, it's July right now. So is your mortgage coming up for renewal before November? If so, we should be working on this right now, you know? And if not, if it's coming up maybe a little bit after that, let's talk about where rates are going and let's build a strategy leading into that time frame. and touching base with those people before they get that six-month renewal window from their existing lender that freaks them out and puts pressure on them to sign and resign, you know, right away and stuff, right? So you do have an opportunity to market to that existing database from that perspective. Another big opportunity that I think that's out there right now is, again, we did a lot of talk about some of these collateral transfer switch rules and what constitutes as insurable in certain markets, that's a bigger deal than in others. But being able to do amortization changes and pushouts and still being able to keep a file in the insurable or insured category, depending on what type of mortgage they're currently in, we have a huge opportunity to get business from major banks. We've got, you know, one of our guys on our team right now, he's brand new in the biz. He's been licensed for a couple of months. He's just had two referrals over from a major bank that's not in the channel from one of their mobile mortgage specialists for clients who are up to renewal, who are struggling with the payment shock and they want their amortizations pushed out, but they're in insured mortgages and they don't have the equity stake 
to refinance. And so one of them was in a static payment variable. So their amortization was like 40 years because they hadn't fully increased their payment when they hit that trigger rate. And so they're up to the renewal. They have this huge amortization and the mortgage is insured. And we were able to do an insured transfer switch and reset them at 25 year amortization. Whereas that bank was only willing to set them back at 20 and that payment would have been really high, right? A big payment shock for that client. So when that bank rep realized that we could do that, they sent us another one, right? So, and for the bank rep, you have one thing to keep in mind, right? With those MMS specialists, they don't get paid on renewals. They get paid on refinances. So when those clients come up for renewal, and their clients are talking to them about payment shock and things like that, if they don't have that equity stake to refinance them and push their AM back out and make those changes for them, there's an opportunity there to work with some of those reps as well to maybe gain some business from that side because they don't have a solution to help those clients, but we do, right? On, you know, insure a bull category, collateral transfer switch. If they're coming out of a big bank, they're more than likely in a collateral transfer. We can do an AM push out on that back to the 25 years, stay insure a bull, get them into that lower rate category and get that AM push out without having to do a full refi. Or like I say, for those static payment variables, even if they're insured, if those AMs have been pushed out because of, you know, not fully increasing to that trigger rate, you've got an option there that they don't. So there's an opportunity to talk to some MMS reps, right? And see if maybe there's an opportunity for them to send you some of those clients that they can't really help. And yeah, and how you're marketing this, right? Like, what are you putting out to social media? I think, you know, especially in the beginning, there's a huge push about connect with realtors. And it's like, call 20 realtors a day or whatever. Depending on the market that you're in, you know, if you're in an Alberta market right now, Alberta market's still quite hot. Yes, we're still getting a lot of purchases, realtors are busy. If you're in the Ontario market right now or the Vancouver market, that business is pretty slow. So who are you picking up the phone and calling? Realtors don't deal with renewal business. They're dealing with purchases with new business, right? So you have an opportunity to diversify your portfolio away from just doing purchase business, which is great, right? For a realtor, they're kind of pigeonholed, right? You're either selling the house or buying the house. For us, we're helping people at every stage of their life in all kinds of mortgages. So spread out who you're phoning because, you know, who are your clients going to be interacting with during their mortgage term? Or maybe when they're coming up to renewal, who are they going to be talking to? Probably their accountant, their financial planner, right? If you've got so much a month going into your RSP and you come up to your renewal and now your payment is going up by a thousand bucks a month, you know, where are you going to cut those costs? You might not invest as much, right? So who are the types of people that these clients might be speaking to throughout their mortgage term that isn't a realtor, right? They're not talking about buying or selling, but they're talking about all the other things that are happening in their life, right? Their insurance advisors, like I say, their accountants, their financial planners, those kinds of people, right? So pick up the phone and call different people in different industries. There's a gal on my team and she's in Ontario and back when things were maybe a little hotter on the market in Ontario, she phoned pool installation companies and renovation companies. And she's gotten quite a few referrals from them because the clients come to them, they want a pool, they need access to equity to get that pool. The pool's like, call this broker, they're going to get you the money, we're going to build you the wickedest backyard for you to spend COVID in. And she had a bunch of business that way, right? So think outside the box a little bit about who you're calling because we don't just deal in purchases. And especially for this renewal market, you know, who would you call if you were looking for financial advice coming up to your mortgage renewal? Yeah, that's actually Brandon and I both our situation because we're, I want to say four or five years in the business. So we're relatively newer. We built up our book through realtors, tried and true method, and we still strongly believe in that. So our way of dealing with that was just simply reaching out to more realtors, which helped us establish our book from year over year and then grow some. But I like the fact that diversifying into renewal and refi business through FAs and accountants is definitely another source of business and they're not purchase heavy all the time. And it's definitely something on our radar. And I really like the different way of getting business through like MMSs. Like I've never really thought about that. So that might be something that, I don't know, Brandon, maybe you and I do like a bit of a deep dive on that and figure out what some of the value adds would be for them. Yeah, Jill, I'm kind of curious, what would your script look like for reaching out to someone who's like a mobile mortgage specialist? Because I've chatted with one at RBC before and he was like, oh, I can't accept business or send business to brokers like uh, internal policy. So how would you get around that? Well, it's funny because I think they all say they can't send or receive business from brokers and then they all do. They just do it 
secretly. I mean, I'm not getting paid to send a deal, you know, to an MMS and I'm not paying them if they send mm-hmm. me a deal, right? But I have a rep at every bank, an in-branch specialist at every bank, an MMS with every bank, because sometimes there's deals too that we can't do that we know can get done at the branch, right? You know, I've got a great gal that I work with at CIBC and I've sent her a ton of business over the years. So there is definitely a reciprocal world here where there are things that we can do that they can't and there's things they can do that we can't. And I think if you meet the right person, you have the right conversations, there's definitely some reciprocal business there. There's a CIBC rep that was reaching out and emailing and contacting a lot of brokers here in the West for a period of time there with like an info sheet of the things and the programs that he could do that we couldn't, right? So he went out and researched what brokers struggled with, which, you know, a lot of self-employment stuff, you know, things like that. Like RBC's self-employment policy is, I hate to say, it's like better than anything that we have access to. And so he knew where he had advantages that we don't or where we would have to go to alt lending where he could do it, you know, on an A deal. And he was just like advertising to brokers. He was like, listen, like if you have a deal on your desk that you can't do, Like I might be able to keep these clients on the A side before you go alt with them, right? And I think there's just a mutual respect. And I think where brokers, again, where we get caught up in this mindset piece is that we think of each individual deal as the paycheck and not the bigger picture. But the bigger picture, like I've got a couple of clients that I sent to CIBC to get their mortgage done because I couldn't do it. And they're some of my biggest referral clients. Like I never did their mortgage, but the amount of business they sent me because they were just so happy that I got the deal done. You know, a realtor that I was working with, I couldn't do the deal myself. I sent them to CIBC. We got the deal done. The realtor was so happy just that I helped find them a solution and got that deal done that now that realtor sends me all of their business, all of their referrals, right? So looking at the bigger picture, right? Like it's so easy for us to get pigeonholed and focus on that individual file. But when we look at what's the best, you know, solution or the best situation for the client overall, Sometimes that is dealing with the branch, depending on their situation, right? And if we can get the client into the best situation, having those conversations where you're talking to those MMS, like they're just like us, right? They're hunters too. They're out there looking for business. They're commission-based. When you can have that respectful conversation and say, hey, like sometimes there's going to be stuff that I think is going to be best served by you. And sometimes there's stuff that's best served by me. Let's talk about what I can do that you can't, you know, for example, you know, in our market out here, a lot of my business is insured. We have flex down, right? If clients don't have their full down pay, like they can borrow their 5% down payment off of a line of credit, you know, or a personal loan. Big banks can't do that. There's quite a few of the big banks that don't have that program. They don't have that option. So I'll work with the bank and say, okay, get them the loan get them the line of credit, and then I'll get them the mortgage. And we work on that together, right? You know, and again, and here's an opportunity that I can help serve these clients where you can't, right? Because you don't have that product available, and I do, but we can still get these clients into a mortgage, and you're still selling a a banking product, right? Mm -hmm. I love that because it just creates a way better experience for clients and also just shows you as a way stronger broker. And when you partner with other banks and institutions like that, you're coming up with this full holistic scenario so that for your referral partners, it's like, why would I bother even sending them to my branch contact when I know that if Jill, if Tom, if Brandon can't get this deal done, they have someone at the branch who can then step in and see it past the finish line. So people have this immense confidence in your ability to just get things pushed through. Yeah, 100%. Like some of my best referral partners, if a client tells them that they're working with their bank, they literally will say to their client, call Jill anyway, because she might even get you a better rate at your bank. And that's true, right? We do, oftentimes we get lower interest rates at some of these banks than they actually will get themselves at the bank. I just had one the other day with, you know, a Scotia client. She went to her branch first and they had done a rate hold for her and a pre-approval. And then when it came time to write, you know, she was referred to me, you know, they were like, you have to talk to her anyway. She calls me. It was a super fast turnaround, super fast COF on the file, Calgary purchase where things are a bit hot right now. And her branch told her, you know, when she wrote the offer, she called the branch and They said to her, you need an extension. We can't meet that turnaround of like four days. And she came to me and I got her the approval at her bank at Scotia. And I got five bips lower on the rate than what they were able to offer her in the branch level. And we got her deal all done in time. And she was like, wow, you know, so now that referral partner, again, like that just cements back to that referral partner, right? Like it doesn't even matter if the client's talking to their own bank. 
they're still sending them to me anyway. They're like, call her for a second opinion. Like you have to phone her because you might even just get a better rate at your own bank, right? Yeah, you, you want to yeah, be the quarterback. Exactly. And I've always said that too. You want them to come to you first and then you can delegate it and push them to another contact of yours if it goes that direction. And circling back on the MMS, I think like you touched on it, like the nail on the head there. I think the biggest value add is you have this connecting piece that you can both help each other out. You send leads to them, they send leads to you. And I think that's a good way of opening the conversation and not just saying like, hey, can you send me some of your renewal business that you don't get paid on? It's more like, hey, I have a value add for you as well. Yeah. And I send more to the branch rep than they send back to me for sure. But I also retained those referral relationships and those clients like by sending them to that branch rep. It's interesting too, because sending them to the branch rep doesn't mean that you've lost that client. You're the person that they contacted in the first place. So when their renewal is up, they're like, Hey, Jill, (laughs) you helped me out last time. Now what else is out there? They're not married to the bank For because sure, that's yeah. where their mortgage got placed. And you right? know, they're not reaching out anyways. They're not being proactive. They're in your database and you're sending your weekly or biweekly, monthly newsletter, whatever you have going on, you're keeping in touch. I know you definitely do a good job of doing that. Whereas, you know, the bank's not doing that. You can still track whatever the mortgage they have too. After they close, you can get the details of the mortgage, track their maturity date. They have a variable. You can do the variable tracking as well. Like there's other opportunities there, even if you don't close on the actual mortgage. Yeah, a thousand percent. I was going to say to that, if you're in this market where you are unable to help someone, and this should be in any situation or even these files where the clients come to you and their bank is offering them a better renewal rate and you can't beat it. And so you send them back to their bank and you don't ever intake an application, whatever. At the bare minimum, you know from that intake call, you've got their phone number, you've got their email address, you've got their name, and you know how much their mortgage is worth, who it's with, and what the renewal date is. So if they're going back to their bank and renewing with their existing lender, you should be tracking that next renewal. Like if they say to you, yeah, we're going with the five year, they're offering me this. And you're like, man, I can't touch that. That's great to take the five year, whatever, you know, they should be in your database that now you're following up. And then you're sending them those, hey, your renewal's coming up in five years from now, you should be following up before their next renewal, try to win them the next time. Because the one thing that we've learned in this industry, right, is one month, one lender might have the lowest rates. And the next month, they might be the highest rates. Lenders have, you know, different buckets that they need to fill and quotas that they need to meet. And they change those rates all the time based on their turnaround times, how slammed they are in their underwriting departments, whether they've filled their quota for this quarter, for this year or not. Do they need to fill more insured mortgages versus conventional mortgages? Like, what are they trying to push? What product are they trying to push? So rates are changing all the time. And there's sometimes we'll place a client with one lender and they have the absolute lowest rate on the market at the time we place it. And then when their renewal comes up, they're the highest lender out there. And now we're moving them somewhere else. So like I say, just because you're placing those clients there or just because those clients are renewing with their existing lender doesn't mean they're a lost opportunity. Again, this is the long game, right? We're not just brokering today and closing deals today to get paid next month. We also want to set up our pipeline for what's happening in three to five years from now because hopefully we're all still brokering in three to five years from now, right? So we want to know what that looks like. Where is that business going to be coming from? Yeah. And speaking of that, I'd actually love your opinion as to what your take is on this. Obviously, we've seen a lot more three-year fixed terms. And there's kind of some speculation out there that lenders might be trying to favor that more because they're now understanding that they can pay us less. Over the last couple of years, we've been doing a bunch of short-term fix. Do you see that as more of the ongoing trend? Or do you think we're going to veer back to the five-year terms? I don't think that this is a nefarious attempt from the lenders to pay us less. When it comes to commissions on a mortgage, paying someone three grand versus six grand, like it's minuscule compared to the world in which they're in. Lenders don't love mortgages in short terms. They don't really start making money on those terms you know, until they're in year four, year five. Anyway, the five year fixed is the most optimal money making venture for each lender. So I think that these incentives and this push that we're seeing on the shorter terms is a reaction to consumer habits. And some of our regional lenders or balance sheet lenders coming out with some pretty competitive stuff that a lot of our other lenders need to sort of, you know, get on board with, right? So if the consumer is all about the three year fixed right now, 
then that's where we're going to see lenders come in with some competition because they're competing with each other to get the three-year fix because that's what the clients are looking for, right? The clients are a little risk adverse to the five-year fixed at the moment. And to be fair, brokers have been pretty risk adverse to a five-year fix. We've been advising clients for a decade here about variable and the risks of rates dropping and IRD penalties and all this kind of stuff, right? So I think what we're seeing is a reaction to the market. I don't think it has anything to do with worrying about paying us less or you know, any of that kind of thing, right? Because from their perspective, they're paying their staff the same amount of money to underwrite that deal, knowing that they have a very high risk of losing that file in three years before they're really turning a profit on it. They would love if all of our deals were five-year fixed right now, right? They would absolutely love that, right? So it's costing them the same amount to underwrite and process that deal, whether that client's in a three-year or a five-year. So obviously they would love if they had them locked in for a little longer. But I do see clients' habits will start to shift back to the five-year. I'm starting to see it now. I'm starting to see it too. Yeah, because the other part is how far down do we think the rates are going to go? Like, you know, for insured business out here, we've got a lender here, a credit union in Alberta that's doing 464. We've been able to get, you know, 459 and stuff with them, uh, depending on the file size. If we're getting a five-year fixed rate now for 459, and we think that rates are probably going to level out in the four to four and a half range in the next few years anyway on a insured yeah. five-year fix. If you're the client and you're comparing, you know, 499 or 489 on a three-year versus 459 on a five-year, and you think that we're kind of back to level playing field on rates, like I would take the five-year, you know, because why hedge the bets, right? Like if you're over 5%, you know, if you're in a conventional category, you might be hedging your bets and going with the three-year. But when we're already seeing rates in that four and a half range, I don't know that rates are going down that much more. I don't know. That's my totally un... I am not an economist. Don't know if you knew that or not. But uh, (laughs) You are the mortgage nerd though, so... Yeah, I might be a bit nerdy, but like, I mean, fuck. Like as if any of us could have predicted where rates were going to be now five years ago or two years ago even let alone where we think rates are going to be in the next couple of years right you know and probably some of this depends on your client's politics i do a lot of five-year fix i do a lot of three-year fix right now you know depending on the type of clients if i've got clients that are like heavy conservative oil field kind of clients they don't trust what's happening with interest rates at the government level right so there's a little bit of that like a political bias and stuff there too about what they feel a little bit more comfortable with as well For sure. And I think a big piece here is just like the clients, I always tell them there's no crystal ball. We don't really know what's going to happen. We have indicators, you know, there's inflation, there's bond market, et cetera, et cetera. There's all these indicators, but we had all these indicators years ago and we still put clients in variable mortgages where obviously in hindsight, we might've put them in a five-year fix if we knew they would have stayed at 2%. So I always tell the clients like, What makes you sleep at night? Is it the idea of saving future money or is it just knowing that you have to make this payment for the next couple of years, you can set it and forget it. Maybe it comes down, maybe it doesn't, but you will never think about it again. And a lot of them lately are just like, you know what, I don't want to think about this anymore. This has been a stressful time coming up for renewal at this time. I've dealt with some of the debt. I've dealt with some of the other pieces. I just want to move on and enjoy life outside of worrying about my household costs. And I think for a lot of those people, it's like the five year makes sense for them. And the lenders do still comp wonderfully on that side of things. I think a lot of where we're seeing the three year fix and stuff like that is that we're recommending sometimes based on our assumptions or our opinions, but that's not necessarily in line with the client. So I know this year I've kind of reshaped how I approach those conversations and listened I always listen to the clients, but I felt like I sometimes brought my lens to the table too much. So this year, I've gotten a lot better of just removing my worldview or my perspective from the equation and just listening fully to what's right for them and then having that dictate the steps. Yeah, ditto to the lessons learned, right? Like, if I could go back in time and never recommend a variable in 2020 to or 2021 anyways, to any of my clients, like I'd probably be a little happier, right? I think we get caught up a little bit too much in our opinions. You know, I think it was Dustin Woodhouse that had said the best, you know, we inform and the clients advise. 
So Mm -hmm. I've sort of changed that approach from, you know, when the clients would say to me, well, what do you think is going to happen? And I go, oh, well, you know, the economy, I don't know, this, that. Now I come away and I literally say that to them. I was like, well, if only I had a crystal ball, like I wish I could predict the future, but I can't. So I'll say, here's the difference. So here's the difference between a fixed and a variable. Here's the difference between the penalties on the two. Oh, you're leaning towards fixed. Okay. Here's the difference between a three-year and a five-year. Here's the difference in a penalty impact between the two. Oh, okay. You're leaning towards the three-year. Okay. Here's our options with the three-year. Like I'm very much like, here's the information. Here's the difference. How do you feel about that? I want that client to make that decision. And I generally say to them, look, there's no right or wrong answer here. This is like saying, do you like chocolate cake or vanilla cake? Like there's no right or wrong answer. All cake is delicious which one would you prefer, right? And you're making a decision right now based on the information that you have at this time. You might regret this decision five years from now or three years from now, or you might be super ecstatic about your decision three or five years from now. And all of that just depends on your personal risk tolerance and what you think or where you think your life's going. But there's no right or wrong answer here. Like it's how do you feel about the market and what's happening and where's your risk tolerance? 100%. Okay, so obviously we covered a lot today and I think my key takeaways really are having the mindset of serving the client and not looking for the immediate gain and just really hammering that home. And then Jill, you touched on some great opportunities for different referral sources and where people can start to get some of this business. And then also some key strategies for how to retain those clients once you get them into your orbit. I just want to plug one thing. I know Jill is going to do a renewal workshop in the fall. And she also has a three-day course as well. So if you want to go deeper than we went today on any of this stuff, connect with Jill. She's really active on Facebook and social. Join Newbie Mortgage Professionals Facebook group. Even if you're not a newbie, there's so much value in that group. And if you're an established agent or broker, share some of your insights because this industry really grows by osmosis and people sharing and helping each other grow and evolve that way. And we always say a rising tide lifts all ships. And Jill, you are an exemplar of this in the industry because you provide so much value to people. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing with our audience. It was great to have you and super stoked about it. Well, thanks so much for having me. And yeah, I think, you know, the better we all do, the better we do as an industry, right? So the better consumer confidence is around our industry and around working with brokers. So yeah, sharing of information, you know, you're not giving away trade secrets to the competition here by helping another broker out, right? So uh, yeah, appreciate it. Thank you for having me on and let's do it again sometime. We'll chat about some more next time. Yeah, I was just gonna say, we can have you on later this year and kind of do like a refresher update on where things are at with our renewal opportunities. We'd love to have you on again. I'd love to be back. So thanks guys. Thanks, Joe.